Yeah, it's a role that, um, again, it used to be called telemarketing back in the day. Um, and it was a role that was uh, kind of geared towards, um, you know, a, a group of people that were on the phones and they were managing and qualifying inbound leads and inquiries. But over the last 20 years, it's absolutely developed into, in my opinion, a must-have role for B2B technology companies. And if, if you look at companies like Oracle and Salesforce.com 20 years ago, uh, but now all of the kind of high flyer uh, venture back companies here in the Valley, uh, most of them, if not all of them, surge uh, their pipeline and revenues on the backs of the sales development rep. Um, and uh, what's happened in the last 20 years is with all the cool MarTech and sales tech and revenue technology companies, uh, it's afforded the uh, non-quota carrying uh, sales resource to prospect Uh in a way that um, just allows for sales reps to focus their efforts on selling, negotiating, and closing, and leaving the kind of heavy lift of bush beating, uh, right, uh, prospecting to the non-quota carrying SDR. And so the way I explain it to people, it's the appointment setters. Um, if you can find a target persona in a target account and get them to say yes to a 20, 25 minute meeting, you know, a days or a week later, then you accelerate pipeline generation and you allow a sales rep uh, not to have to do that heavy lift. Because it turns out, Mark, that the hardest part of closing any deal is finding it. Selling is just a bunch of activities and uh, you go down, a, a, a right, you, you, there's a dance. But to find that partner is the hardest part of doing any deal. And that's really what sales development um, has become here uh, for B2B technology sales. It's finding that interested party that is curious enough and wants to learn more. And it's the sales development rep's job to find that person and tee that first meeting up for the sales rep. Such a core role to the success, uh, to your point of modern day tech companies. We were, we were joking about it prior too, but you've been through five IPOs, is it? Five, yeah, it's kind of stupid, but, uh, and there's a story <laughs> behind that too. And, and what I learned and how to find companies at very early stages. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, one of the recipes and components of all the companies I joined at early stage that did become public was the pipeline generation and the, you know, the, the opportunities that went into the pipeline that created a predictable outcome, you know, quarter over quarter uh, and helped launch these companies into the place where they actually could go public. Um, and I would, I would, I would, you know, for any young founder out there that has a uh, B2B focus on their uh, technology, um, if it's right, and there's a recipe, if it's a, a commodity, low price, uh, high velocity, you know, two week to three week average sales cycle, um, SDR may not be the, the role. Um, SDRs work incredibly well in a uh, slightly more complex sale, higher average sales price and longer sales cycle. Well, so I got my start. Uh, I graduated from the University of California at Santa Barbara, and I got my first job uh, with, a, with Xerox Corporation. And I became a frontline, it was called marketing development rep back then. Uh, and I carried, I actually carried quota to sell typewriters, fax machines, and copiers. Um, but I joined Xerox because at the time, there were two companies in the world that uh, spent energy, time, and focus on developing young sales talent. And uh, I had a, a life coach or mentor that said, Lars, you're coming out of college. Uh, you have a lot of energy, but you don't know much yet. Go learn how to sell. It doesn't matter what you end up doing in life. You know, learning how to present, learning how to negotiate, learning how to handle objections, learning how to close are things that it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to need. Made sense to me at the time. Um, what I 
got issued to me when I started my job at Xerox in 1989. Uh, I got a, a, a pitch book, uh, a, a, a book that had all the products that I was going to sell. They handed me a gas card because um, they expected me to drive into my territory. And they issued me a pager, which is uh, for those of you that don't know what a pager is, it's a liquid crystal <laughs> display on a little box that you put on your belt. And that was the st status of inbound leads back, you know, 34 years ago. I would get paged by my boss, Bruce Roberts, when he had an inbound lead. Um, I, there was no internet. There was no mobile phones. There was no laptops. So when I got the page on my belt that vibrated, I knew, and I saw Bruce Roberts' number, I knew I had to get to a phone. Um, and I was out in my territory. And for me, that was hightailing it as quickly as I could to a Denny's restaurant because Denny's have pay phones. <laughs> and then I would grab a couple dimes because a uh, phone call was 20 cents back then from a pay phone. I'd call Bruce. Um, he would tell me uh, that he got an inbound lead from, you know, Johnny of, you know, ABC dot company. I would write it down on a pad uh, and I would put two more dimes in and call Johnny at the uh, ABC company. And I would set up an appointment to come out and then I would drive, you know, my little Toyota MR2 out to uh, where they were and I uh, would discuss. So again, lots has changed since then, but that was the state really, that was the technology and the state of lead operations and managing inbound leads uh, back in the eighties. Uh, so yeah, quite a bit has changed since then, Mark. I love it. I love hearing the stories and I don't want to date you, Lars, but you started that job when I was born. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, <laughs> well, it's, I it's mean, awesome hearing about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, fast forward then 10 years later, I joined a company my first kind of venture back company up here in the San Francisco area, a company called Portal Software. And I had a boss, his name was Bernie Scamra, and he was building out an enterprise class software team to sell what we had at the time, which was uh, kind of an online billing system. And uh, we had just done a deal with Microsoft, and this was back in 1997. And we started to get noticed, and we started to get a bunch of inbound leads in the form of calls. Email was just coming online, so we were getting emails, and we were getting leads in various formats. And what he recognized was that uh, with the sellers that he had, he was paying them quite a bit of money and he didn't want them hampered by getting slowed down by having to uh, manage and triage and research and call back and qualify all these inbound leads uh, because it was slowing down the reps that were actively selling, negotiating and closing. And he just looked at me and he said, Lars, you don't really know what you're doing in the software sales. Uh, so do me a favor, build me a team where my reps don't have to prospect. And that's, and I will credit Bernie Scamra with the development and the, I guess the, you know, the, the modern day SDR, because in 1997, um, the role was still called telemarketing. Um, and most organizations out there had, you know, they had telecenters and there were people that were taking these inbound leads and qualifying them. Um, but there wasn't any outbound uh, to speak of. In any event, I took his guidance and I started hiring uh, other people that uh, were generally younger in their career. And I can put them I could put them into a process. Um, and I actually gave them uh, white pages uh, or yellow pages. And I gave them uh, access to industry periodicals where uh, there were names of companies, Celex and Ilex and uh, internet service providers. Um, and we started doing outbound. Um, and what happened was exactly what Bernie had envisioned. This team got the opportunity to qualify uh, a targeted individual at a target account and prime the pump for the account executives so they didn't have to stop their selling motions. And that was the key. Uh, keep sales reps focused on selling activities and give the heavy lift hardest part of doing any deal type of activity to a younger in their career 
not necessarily younger, but a person that wants to maybe learn how to sell. And the best way to do that is to learn how to qualify. So uh, that's when I started my first kind of modern day SDR team uh, was in 1997 for Bernie Scamra at Portal Software. I love it. That's it's awesome. And you can already see, you know, in those 10 year span that you're talking about the evolution, uh, I'm sure you were, you know, uh, the, the industry probably wasn't selling typewriters come 97, right? It was probably moved on from that point. Well, yeah, I mean, just, I mean, and today, if you think about today, you know, I used to hoof it up and down Pacific Coast Highway in Southern California. The badge of courage of a uh, marketing development rep for Xerox Corporation was how many times we had to resole our shoes in, in, any, given, in any given year. I mean, uh, that was the cool thing. It's like, no, no, three times over here. Uh, you knew that if someone had to resole their shoes three times, that they were humping it, they were hoofing it, um, and uh, it likely showed in their numbers. Um, and getting that inbound lead and being able to drive to a Denny's and make a call and get, uh, you know, uh, get an opportunity to go right to someone who had a need, that was a big deal. That was the Glen Gary lead back then. The, uh, you know, the command and control center uh, that is, uh, you know, the one or two screens that an SDR uses every day. Uh, it's all about technology, process, and playbooking out what an SDR does when they wake up in the morning and what they do during the day, week, and month. And again, certainly CRM, when Salesforce.com hit the scene in 1999, um, was a massive force multiplier for the sales uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sales space alone. But when they opened up their CRM to other companies that could deploy their efficiency on top of it, uh, all of a sudden um, sales engagement, uh, data providers uh, like Zoom Info, um, uh, these companies like uh, Sixth Sense and Conversica and Drift and Bombora, companies that automate uh, not only intent, but also companies that deliver, you know, qualified uh, and personas, right? To get the email, to get the office number, to get the mobile number of specifically titled individuals at the companies that you're targeting. Um, you know, for me, I had to walk up and down the street and find an office manager that had a, co had a copier big enough for me to um, get excited about. Today, if I want to run a list of anyone that has data architecture in their title working for CPG or healthcare companies in the Pacific Northwest uh, that are anywhere from 500 million to 2 billion in revenues, I can deliver that list in less than a second by, you know, just typing in a search string. Um, and then I can go and I can, uh, you know, Google search them and, and create a personalized with context outreach or, uh, you know, uh, touch pattern sequence sequence that includes email might be a leaving of a voicemail. I might be, uh, want to send a Sendoso or a, uh, a gift card or something uh, that will jog their, uh, you know, memory of, uh, you know, getting sent something in the mail, um, which has a hundred percent open rate. Um, and more now ever, people are going onto LinkedIn and Facebook and learning more about their target persona so they can create this personalization and context. I think the the lesson here is that if you have a technology or you have a solution or you have a service that um, you want to get in front of someone, you have to realize and understand um, what their pains are, right? People either know that they have pain and they're looking for a solution or they don't know that they have it uh, because they have a lot of other things going on. And in either case, uh, if you're a company um, and you want to get in front of that person, you have to you have to have that right emotion 
that pushes your value proposition and your value and your, you know, what it is you're offering um, out into the world so that people can trip over it. Um, you know, there are people out there searching for uh, solutions to their problems, um, but there's also people that don't know, but they they hang out at places, right? They go to meetups, they uh, subscribe to podcasts, uh, they go to, uh, they might even go to in-person events um, and they they know who each other are, right? Uh, I'm a VP of global sales development. Um, I know where all the people that do what I do hang out. They hang out on the modern sales pros. Uh, they do go to uh, Dreamforce. Uh, they go to Saster. They go to the Topo Summit. Um, that's where I go to hang out with the people that do my job and we share best practices. So if you're a company looking to uh, understand where your target personas are, you have to do the research so that you can create messaging and content and uh, leave these assets for them to trip over um, and at the same time provide an experience where if they're searching, that they're going to find you. Because um, all of those, right, when people are searching and they kind of trip over you, um, it's a listen, it's a open it's a share, it's a uh, watch. Um, those are all inquiries, right? Those all become part of the engagement that you want to see. And all that's captured, right? Uh, if you have a really good marketing automation system or a CRM, those are all the kinds of kind of leads or inquiries that SDRs will follow. Uh, and when they get to a certain level, um, they get excited about the outreach and, and the potential future engagement and booking of a meeting for a, an account exec. Well, we've already seen a few companies trying. I mean, automation is such a big story in sales and marketing. I mean, the science of sales and marketing has, I think, is the big story in the last five to 10 years. And the art in my opinion, is finding that revenue operator, that sales and marketing operations person that understands how to pick the various technologies and then mash them up together, orchestrate them so that you can, as an SDR, launch an outbound cold sequence uh, or cadence or touch pattern um, where necessi not necessarily you're following up on every single one, uh, you know, uh, with uh, a call that you make from a phone and you leave your own voicemail, but you can launch, right? If you dump or you curate a list of 10,000, uh, well, let's just, for, the, for this argument's sake, 100 personas across 10 companies, you know, make sure that it's personalized and it's contextualized to the role, to the industry, uh, maybe even to the geography, um, and sit back and wait for the people, your intended targets to, you know, raise their hand or to click on the call to action. Um, with that mentality, you can literally every day reach out to thousands of people and provide an experience where they get to opt in or opt out of a very intelligent nurturing path. And again, you know, with all of the, uh, um, um, uh, what are the, uh, with all the privacy and audit compliancy, I mean, you do have to be careful, but in my heart of hearts, I believe that if you're targeting someone that you believe has pain for what your solution can solve and you're providing valuable insights and educating them and inspiring them to what is possible with your technology, that is a, that, that's an outbound cold sequence that is worth sending. Um, you don't want to blanket kind of spray and pray your, your messaging to people that really don't care. Maybe they're too low or they're too high, but I do believe that if you take the time and the energy and you curate uh, the right list uh, of people into the right accounts that are targets and ideal customer profiles for you, that these people are, are not going to report you to the spam police. Um, they're either going to be interested and file that away and for reading it later or read it right then, or they're just going to hit delete. 
Um, and that's what you want. You want to provide an experience where people get to opt in, opt out, or save for later. And, uh, you know, the modern outbound kind of sales enablement sequence uh, allows for just that. Um, and that's what we're doing. Um, that's what SDR leaders are doing uh, across the globe is they're implementing sales engagement, which in my opinion is probably the biggest um, leap forward in CRM or Salesforce automation that we've seen in our profession in 20 years. Um, it was very manual before that. And today, you know, an outreach, a sales loft, um, and there's many, many firms that provide this kind of uh, outbound uh, touch pattern orchestration. Um, but it takes thought and it takes energy and it takes A-B split testing uh, to figure out what works. Uh, and I think the very best sales development, business development organizations, they spend a lot of time kind of um, iterating and noodling through uh, what works. Is it 10 touches uh, across three channels? Is it 24 touches across four channels? Um, and again, it's different uh, if you're going after a, a, a mid-manager level target at a very large company versus maybe a, a, a principal or a C-level at a very small company. Uh, the language you use the number of touches, uh, the assets that you embed as links into the outreach all have to be slightly different. I think we've already seen that uh, in certain parts, uh, right? If, if, if you're managing uh, an inbound, um, if you're selling something that has a one to two to three or four week sales cycle that is, you know, in the thousands, maybe five or 10,000, you have to set up an environment where someone who is looking for that solution can go into your environment, whether that's your website or not, uh, view uh, what a, you know, a, you download a free trial or look at a demo and be able to shopping cart it. In other words, click, I'm ready to go and buy that and then put it into a sandbox uh, and then, you know, purchase it and deploy it and customize it and off to the races. That already exists. As you go up the stack uh, to more complex solutions where you have multi-stakeholder environments and you have to consensus sell and you have influencers and you have, we go through procurement and you have potential blockers right? You have to get into a sales cycle. Um, and that company likely wants to see a custom demo or they want to do a proof of concept over three or four weeks. You're going to have to have human interaction. And for those types of sales cycles, which is where I've spent most of my career, the one-two punch of the SDR feeding the uh, outside quota carrying account executive is critical. It turns out if you do all this right, one fully kind of burdened or uh, ramped SDR can fill the pipeline of up to three, sometimes four account executives. And so for those earlier stage companies that are listening to this, if you're a, a founder or a C-level at an earlier stage company and you don't you haven't heard about this SDR motion, um, there's still a lot of people that think, well, if I'm going to hire a salesperson, I want them to close because I need and want that revenue. Well, if you consider that one SDR at 80,000 OTE, you know, uh, a salary of 55 or 60,000 can fill the pipeline of up to three account execs that you're paying 250 to 350,000 OTE, the efficiency and the effectiveness of building pipeline, which is the only thing that matters, right? Pipeline creates predictability uh, and also revenue. Then... It's not even a, it's, I mean, the, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, and it's the kind of the biggest no brainer in the history of sales is that SDR to AE motion. And again, um, it's kind of stupid, but I joined Snowflake uh, a couple of weeks before the IPO. So I did, I was not there. I did not do the heavy lift. The other four companies that I joined, I joined at a very early stage and I deployed this recipe of the one, two, SDR 
uh, to hand off to AE Motion. And it absolutely was a, a big part of how those companies were able to scale, uh, prove to their institutional investors that they could grow at a, an alarmingly high rate and get more funding and continue the cycle. And eventually they all went public. Um, anyway, uh, I can talk SDR all day long. Um, it's absolutely a role that I believe is a must have in any kind of long term high value complex sales cycle. The SDR role, again, for anyone out there, whether you're just getting out of college or uh, you're not even in college, but you have this fire in the belly, right? You don't go to college to learn how to sell. Um, you are motivated, whether you're money motivated or you're motivated to get out in front of people and uh, move the needle uh, for a you know, fast growing high tech company. I can't imagine a better start for a younger person. But also, you know, what I've seen, you know, veterans that are coming uh, out of the military and want to come back into the workforce, um, parents uh, that have spent, whether it's years or decades at home, that want to come back into the workforce, uh, people that want to, you know, see what this, uh, what this high tech uh, venture backed uh technology world is all about. It's one of the only roles, kind of entry-level positions that you don't need to have <laughs> right, engineering degree or advanced degree. If you prove to me that you have fire in the belly, uh, which some people refer to as grit, right? It's that thing you can't teach, right? I always say you can't teach height. I don't know if you can teach fire in the belly. You either have it or you don't. And for me, right, I got up early. I stayed late. And I worked hard, long, and smart. And I just did that every day. And where did I learn that? I learned that from my parents in my upbringing. And I ran around with some kids when I was in you know, grade school, high school, and college that uh, I looked up to, right? They say that um, you are the average of your five closest connections or friends. Um, they're either bringing you up or bringing you down. I was lucky. I had a group that I ran with that uh, we're always looking uh, to go to the next level. Um, and that's not always the case. So anyway, um, if uh, we're hiring a ton all over the world at Snowflake, so uh, for any of you out there that are listening and think an SDR role might be uh, the right for you, um, I'd love to talk to you. LinkedIn is fine. Also, all of the positions that we have at Snowflake, including sales development, are all on our careers site. And again, I mean, whether it's San Mateo or Denver or Atlanta or Sydney or Singapore, uh, Bellevue uh, coming up here in a little bit, uh, we're open for business. Mm -hmm.